You are listening to This is Oklahoma, hosted by Mike Hearn, telling stories of Oklahomans and those that have made it their home. What's up, guys? Welcome back to another episode of This is Oklahoma podcast. Mike Hearn here, your host, back with another episode. Excited to share this episode with you today. But before we do, I've got to thank our sponsors. First of all, the Oklahoma Hall of Fame. They've been a huge part of this podcast for the last few years. So the Oklahoma Hall of Fame have been sharing Oklahoma's story through its people since 1927. For more information on the Oklahoma Hall of Fame, go to www.oklahomahof.com. And for daily updates, go to Oklahoma HOF on Instagram and give them a follow. Our other sponsor today is Chicksaw Nation. Now, the Chicksaw Nation have sponsored pretty much everything in Oklahoma. They're a huge supporter of Oklahoma. And it's an honor to have their name and their brand supporting this podcast. So a huge shout out to Governor Anna Toby for supporting this podcast. It really means a lot. And finally, our third sponsor is 988. The Oklahoma 988 Mental Health Lifeline. 988 is a direct three-digit lifeline that connects you with trained behavioral health professionals that can get all Oklahomans the help that they need. Learn more by visiting 988oklahoma.com. That's 988oklahoma.com. And now, let's get into today's episode. Let's give a warm welcome to, welcome to my guest. Uh, last year, he was inducted into the Oklahoma Hall of Fame artist, uh, Mr. Harvey Pratt. Thank you so much for coming down. It's a pleasure. I'm glad, I'm glad to do this. Yeah, I'm excited. I mean, we just chatted a little bit before. My wife is also a tribe member, a part of the tribe of the Cheyenne Arapaho, and, and you know you know her family very well. They're yes. all artists, and I know you kind of run in the same... You know, you're, every, The art world is such a small world, right? Especially in the tribal arts, and, and Brent, I think you know very well, he's is one of her uncles and is very good at it and speaks extremely highly of you as well and your artwork. So I have heard about you before Brent, you were John, inducted. Johnny, I talk, we visit with Johnny quite a bit. Yeah, 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 yeah. <clears throat> it's really, it's great for me to get that education from my wife's side of the family because growing up in the UK, we didn't have, you know, a Native American history class, right? Whereas I get to learn all these things from my wife. And, and even today, we've been catching up on, on the TV show Reservation Dogs. And I'm like, is that real? Does this happen? And she's like, oh, no, this this is a thing. And the owls was one of the, it was the owls, the first yeah. thing I caught on right. to. And, um, you know, it, 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 I wish more people got to know that. And I'm fortunate enough that my wife is, is you know, Native American. I get to learn this stuff. And Sadly, people aren't as fortunate. Well, but not all tribes, uh, yeah, see the owl the same way, you know. Yeah, but it's um, I was I'm just it's just fascinating to me that you know history is one of the greatest you know things ever. I'm you know, and I, I agree with that. I, I loved history, and I love I love history. Now we belong to a historical group that yeah. that we visit once a month, and they and they have guest speakers in it. They talk about the history of, and uh, but. Uh, I, I heard that they were cutting our the Oklahoma history classes in, in the curriculum, mm. cutting it in half. Yeah, that's too bad. I hate that. Yeah, it's it's sad. It's history really sad. and Oklahoma history. They're cutting them all in half. Mm-hmm. Right? That's you know, we need to learn from history. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, that's. I mean, and to the point. I know we have. Uh, you know, we have the exhibit that's coming about the Battle of Washtar upstairs. You know, the the massacre right. of a Washtar, which you're very involved in. That's coming and. It is, you know, I think in today's world, it is a little bit, you know, people might see it as a, a hard topic to get over and very hard to experience, but it's history and we have to teach it. And there's so much to learn from that rather than not talking about it. You know, uh, sometimes history can be one sided, you know, just one side. The winners tell the story and the losers don't get to tell their story mm-hmm. in, in, in history. And uh, uh we, we see that that's still happening, that they yeah. try to alter history a little bit. Yeah. You know, protect, a, protect a certain group of people then alter the history a little bit. That's, and that's kind of, except we've experienced some of those things, you know, and said you're not telling history correctly. Yeah. <clears throat> so you're predominantly known as an artist. You're, you've spent, uh, I mean, what was it, 50 years doing, doing the artwork for mostly in, in the, for the law enforcement, right? So yes. Uh, but I, uh, I, uh, when I got out of the Marine Corps, I, I uh, got into law enforcement mm-hmm. almost immediately. And I've, I've been very fortunate to have been around a lot of uh, really dedicated people and honest, hardworking. <clears throat> and uh, so you kind of you kind of fall into that group, you know? You, you become that way, You're being around decent people, mm-hmm. decent, hardworking people honest people and 
and so you you stay in that same realm. And uh, I got out when I got out of the Marine Corps and uh, got into law enforcement, and uh, I did my first forensic drawing there on a homicide, <clears throat> and uh, they had. Uh, uh, the captain saw me drawing one time, and then I had a little article in the paper, and he said, this homicide, he said, uh, the, one of the victims is still alive. He said, can you go over there and draw the man that shot her? And I said, sure. I had no idea what I was doing. I'd never experienced that before. But uh, uh, So I went over there and, and did the drawing, and we caught the guy based on my first drawing. And uh, probably if I had not been successful that very first time, uh, I, I, there's a good chance I never would have done it again. But since then, I've done over 5,000 drawings in uh, in my career in law enforcement. And uh, I was the first, after after I retired the first time from OSBI uh, as an assistant director, uh, I was still doing the art uh, all that time. And, and I went, we went to a, to a, a hearing in, at uh, state capitol for appropriations. And, and the director said, uh, well, Harvey's getting ready to retire. <clears throat> and one of the senators said, uh, well, who's going to do what he does? And they said, well, we don't have anybody. And, and they said, what are you going to do, Harvey? And I said, well, I've got about 10 offers from different states that want me to come work for them in the forensics. And uh, the senator said, uh, well, we're in the business of making laws. He said, let's just make a law for you to become the state forensic artist. Would, you, would that be okay? And I said, sure. I said, I, I didn't want to leave. I'd stay here. And and they just put me on another retirement system. So, you know, I ended up getting, drawing two retirements, one in law enforcement, one is one is as a, as a, in a civilian uh, capacity. And I stayed at, I stayed at OSBI until 2017 yeah. when I retired again. And uh, I still get calls from people wanting me to do things and, and, uh, I'm so busy right now, I, I just have a hard time breaking away to go do something. And then uh, when I did do that, I ended up in court, you know, and I'm, I'm it just ties your time up yeah. and, and that you don't get compensated for it, you know, so. But yeah, I've, I've had a great career. The creator has done, has really been good to me. And he gave me a, a beautiful wife and hard work and she does all the hard work for me, does it, does, does all the promotions, everything on the computer, and I'm, I'm just really fortunate. <clears throat> yeah, you're 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 the typical artist, right? You just want to do what you do, and you like doing what you do, and all that other stuff. You'd rather pass to somebody. See? Yeah, you're, I got paint on you got my paint hands. On you, yes, I, exactly. painted, I got up this morning and started painting. <laughs> And uh, I just now saw that shoulder. I said, I, but I got I got paint on all of my clothes. Yeah, of course. You know, I'd come yeah. home from work and I'd sit down, start painting. The next thing you know, I'd have it on my cuffs, you know, yeah. on my pants. And and she, she said, go put an apron on. <laughs> <laughs> so obviously art is a huge part of your life. How does it begin? How does, do you see family painting? Like, is it, I mean, how, how does art come into your life as a young child? You know, I think uh, I became really interested in art when my first grade teacher, and I always remember her, Mrs. Jones, mm -hmm. she said, well, Harvey, you've got a little talent, you know, because we were, we were drawing things and, and uh, she, she uh, complimented me. And, you know, children, uh, they don't know they have talent until someone tells them. Right. You know? You, uh, you you just assume that well everybody can do this you know I can do it they they can do it but they not everybody can do certain things you know so she told me that and then Mrs Wyatt said me said this in, in the in the third grade she said the same thing you know and uh, and then my older brother is an artist <clears throat> so he was in school uh, as I followed the three grades behind him you know they would say is Charles Pratt your brother can you draw like him and I said. Yeah, I think I can, you know. Yeah. So it just, I was inspired by uh, those two, those teachers and by my brother. And then when I got into high school, uh, <clears throat> I went to St. Patrick's Indian Mission in Anadarko. And we just lived there. In a, and uh, I got to see some of the, the uh, Kiowa Five art that they had in that building up in the attic. And I was, got to look at a bunch of art and got involved. <clears throat> and uh, we didn't have an art class. We didn't have an art class, up. and the priest saw me drawing one day, and and um, he said, Harvey, he said, 
that's that's pretty good. You're pretty talented. He said, Let, let's buy you some supplies. And he bought me some art supplies. He bought me my first paintbrush and, and watercolors and uh, paper and stuff like that. And and uh, I painted a I painted a crucifixion and made everybody Indians. And so I'm a junior in high school and I sold it for ninety dollars. And I thought, holy crap, I can I can make some money doing this, you know. So that's so when you have some success, you know, it inspires you, and, and yeah. people it's, people inspire you, and that's kind of kind of how that all evolved. And I got in the Marine Corps, and I did some stuff for the Marine Corps, did some drawings for them, did, uh, uh, and uh, so I just kind of stayed in that vein and continued to to draw and paint through law enforcement, and yeah. and uh, got in some galleries, you know. So it was. Uh, yeah, I, 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 I and I got to look at a lot of different kind of art. I started off drawing flat art, just at flat, non-dimensional, like an old-time Indian artist. And then I did ledger work, and and I just kind of expanded into several things. And and uh, I started uh, doing some terracotta stuff and firing, firing terracotta. And then I got into bronzes. Mm -hmm. Then I got into wood carving, and and uh, so I just experimented with a lot of things uh, that, that were that were really. Uh, Good for me, uh, allowed me to reach out and and uh, kind of be creative in a lot of different areas. And I'm, I'm very fortunate in that, that I, could, that I was able to do all those different types of, of art. And uh, I designed uh, the Oklahoma Centennial Blanket, yeah. Pendleton Blanket. I designed that. I designed the, the uh, National Native American Veterans Pendleton Blanket, you know, so I, I've just really got into a lot of little different, a lot of different things in a lot of ways, you know, yeah. and uh, which kept me being creative and, 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 and just allowed me to, to have some success in a lot of different uh, areas. Yeah. Yeah. It's amazing what... When, when you're a little, when you're a child, it's amazing that that one teacher, you know, Mrs. Jones and then Mrs. Wyatt, just that reinforces that you're good at something. And then, you know, your priest just happens to see you doing something and said, well, I'm going to invest in you. I'm going to buy you our supplies. Like these little moments, right? Yeah. They seem so small at the time. And yeah. it's probably a teacher's <clears throat> thing that they tell kids, you're doing a great job. You're doing a great job. But you know, when you look back at your story and you're like, that's continued to reinforce the fact that I was good at this. And then when you sell that painting for $90, you're a junior and you're like, I can do this for the rest of my life, yeah, right? Can, that that I, paves I, the way. I can make some money for the yeah. rest of my life just being an artist. Yeah. And, you know, my brothers told me, Charles, uh, he was a, he's a, he's a famous sculptor and jeweler and, and painter. And he, he, Lived in uh, Italy for a year, learning about stones, how to carve stones and the types of stones. Mm -hmm. And uh, he told me, he said, Harvey, he said, you know, he said, I, even when you were a little boy, he said, you could draw people that looked like the real person. He said, you had that knack about you. He said, and, and I thought, well, I never even knew that. Yeah. You know, I didn't know that. I, 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 you know, I draw somebody. He said, you, you make a drawing. He said, it looked like who, who you're saying. So I guess that kind of kind of came came natural for me. You know, when... Uh, when I was born, I wasn't born Harvey Pratt. I was born Vihunskis, <laughs> which is a Cheyenne word. It means he wants to be a chief. He's going to be a chief. Okay. And they, they named me that because I was a veil baby. You know, I had that membrane on me, and, and I was born in a little house. I was not in a hospital, and my, all my mother's aunts were there. And those old women, when they saw me like that, he said, oh, look at him. He wants to be a chief. See, so they must have they must have seen that somewhere yeah. in their past that somebody was born like that and and uh, became 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 somebody. And so they 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 gave me that name. I kept that name for a long time. Even normally when you come back from the military, from back from war, it, that uh, they could change your name. And I always I didn't change my name. I kept that. And I tried to I was going to join uh, one of the. Cheyenne military uh, societies, the dog soldiers, and uh, mm -hmm. so I started contacting uh, those uh, headsmen, and, yeah. and they were talking to me. And then all of a sudden, the chiefs came. The chiefs just came came in and they said, "Harvey, we want you to join the chiefs lodge." You know, and I said, "Well, that's my name." I said, "That's that's my name. Yeah, I, I, I'll do that. I'll do that, but I have to change my name." 
And uh, I, I said, because you make it took me two years. Gene and I went through this process to to, to get into that chief society, and and uh, I had uh, said I'll change my name. And I said I'm going to take White Thunder's name. It's my great great grandfather. I'm going to take his name so that I won't dishonor it. I always keep in mind of of him, and I won't dishonor his name. And and I think to me that was uh, that was something that was uh, important to me. Uh, to help me to, to stay on, on without stepping down, falling down, doing something wrong, you yeah. know, and, and uh, so I took his name, and I always think about that, it, you know, in the mornings, you know, I say, well, today is the day I need to be better than I was yesterday, yeah. be a better man today than I was yesterday, you know, so, and that's just some of the things that, that uh, uh, the chiefs talk about, you know, and different people talk about those things, and, and like I said, I've just really been fortunate to be around a lot of dedicated people that, uh, constantly lift you up you know yeah and so it, it, to me that was really important to me that to, yeah to, to to be around people and not dishonor them in law enforcement you know and not dishonor the people in the Cheyenne chief not dishonor my wife and you know just right so just things like that that yeah a constant <clears throat> reminder of that you know daily reminder that I, I can do better and I should do better than I was yesterday yeah it's, it's empowering I mean, it's it's super impactful and it's a powerful it's a simple thing to to have right it's very easy to have that and a lot of people don't have that that's right you know and it's such a simple thing to wake up every day and think yeah this is going to constant reminder right it's like writing on your mirror when you when you brush your teeth in the morning just having a note there that says one percent better every day you know just something simple but we don't do that sadly i wish yeah, we did gene and i have a we have a sticky note in on the mirror in the bathroom has a, has a heart on it, has her initials, and I have a heart with my initials on it. It's been there for eight years. We just, you know, we just leave yeah. it there. That little, those little sticky notes are there on the mirror. Yeah. Uh, with a little, or two little hearts with our initials on them. And it's just something that was spontaneous, but it means something to me every time I go in there and I see it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah, that's so Sense. I think there's things that you have to you have to have to kind of lift you up and remind you of who you are. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no doubt. How did you guys meet? Uh, in law enforcement. Okay. Yeah. Great. Yeah, Gina is my wife is a able agent, mm -hmm. alcohol, tobacco, and gaming, and yeah, she retired. We retired the same just a month apart. Amazing. So yeah, so we've been we've been together since the early '90s. Yeah, almost thirty years, right? Yeah. I only know that because I'm 32. <laughs> I'm terrible at math, but I know when I was born, I know how old I am now. <laughs> oh, brilliant. Uh, you mentioned the Marine Corps. What, what leads you to going into the Marine Corps, and then how was, how was your time there? Well, honestly, uh, Indian people have a great respect for their veterans. Mm -hmm. You know, they always honor their veterans. Even a little boy, uh, we would go somewhere, and Mom would say, go shake his hand, go shake his hand, you know. And so I always uh, admired uh, veterans in the military, mm -hmm. and uh, my uncle, Charles, was a Marine in Second World War and in, in, in Korea, and, uh, in, and he was still in during Vietnam. And so he, did, he would, uh, when I went to the West Coast, uh, he, he, came, he came to the training center when I was still in boot camp, and he came here to see me. And uh, there was another Pratt in there, and they, got, they brought him out, and my uncle said, that's not my nephew. Get this guy out of here. He's a guy. He's running out. And, and I, <laughs> me and this man, RD, were, were, uh, we went through boot camp. We went to the military police together. We went to Vietnam together with the recon unit. Mm -hmm. And so we're really close. And we stayed close until he passed away about a year ago. <clears throat> and uh, my uncle, uh, I always admired him. You know, and uh, all, of, all of the family always talked about him, you know, and, and that, uh, he was a Marine Raider in the Second World War, you know, and just I had the greatest respect for him. And and uh, he, uh, when I got out and was coming home, I, I went to see him before I came back to Oklahoma. And, and he said, "Let's go eat it. Let's go eat a steak at the at the slop shoot. What they call the slop shoot? <laughs> Let's go eat." So we went over there and we sat down and he was talking and and a uh, sergeant major and you know came down. And he sat down with my was friends with my uncle. You know, my uncle had ribbons like this all the way up to his shoulder, you know, and and then pretty soon another. I think he was a first sergeant came and sat down and uh, 
they just kind of ignored me. I was the last corporal. They just ignored me, and they were all talking and laughing. And people would come by and throw money on the table. Or they'd come by and they'd put a drink on the table, you know? And, damn, the, the table's just full of $5 bills, you know? And, and uh, <clears throat> finally one of them said, uh, asked her about me, and my uncle said, well, he said, he's, uh, he just came out of Vietnam with a recon unit. He was there with a the recon unit uh, uh, guarding the base and, and picking up shot down pilots. Picked up a lot of pilots. Like they were shooting down a lot of helicopters and a lot of spotter planes. And and, uh, and one of them asked me, he said, uh, oh no, I, first off, uh, they kind of, they got up and it's, you know, and they was walking around shaking hands with everybody. And I, and I said something to my uncle and he said, they're Congressional Medal of Honor winners. That's what they're putting that money down for. See, all these Marines are throwing money on their table. He said, they're Congressional, both of them are Congressional Medal of Honor winners. And I said, holy smokes, you know? <laughs> yeah. I was, and, and I, to this day, I can't remember their names. I was so stunned to sit there. And when they came back down, sat down, and, and uh, one of them said, well, well, what are you doing? And I said, well, I'm trying to catch a hop, which is a hop on an airplane, to go home. And he said, you be at the base at 6 o'clock in the morning. He said, well, I'll put you on a plane. I said, my uncle said, all right, you know. So uh, when I went to the base, they put me on the commandant's airplane. The commandant of the, of the United States Marine Corps, they put me on his plane. And I'm sitting there, and it's a little prop job. <clears throat> you know, it's not a, not a big fancy jet, it's a prop job. Of course, this is in 65. And, and the, all these officers are running around, and I, I don't think I even moved a muscle till they, they landed in Dallas, Texas to let me off. I mean, they made a special stop in Dallas, Texas to let me off, and I thought, man, that those Congressional Medal of Honor winners have a lot of stroke, you know? They have, when they ask somebody to do something, they, people just do it for them. And uh, so that's how I came home, and I, and I always remembered that, you know, and I said, I'm sorry I don't remember those two guys' names, because I would love to, to have read about their exploits and what they've done. <clears throat> Yeah. Two Marine guys, you know, and my uncle was, was, was friends with all these guys. You know, he knew all them old timers, you know, World War II guys. And, and he was missing in action twice. And he's the reason I joined the Marine Corps, mm -hmm. because of him. Yeah. So. Wow. That's, I mean, as reasons go to join the Marine Corps, having someone like that in your life to, to look up to and follow and all the, you know, I'm not surprised when you said that my family looked up to him because of the, you know, the, it's, it's I've, in I've, power, you know, I've got his powerful. picture, we've got his picture and his wife in our, in a bedroom. Yeah. You know, I, all these years, I had hung on, hung on the wall at, at my, at our house mm. in El Reno, hung on the wall there and, and uh, I don't even know how I got it, but I got it. Yeah. And it, it's just really, you know, he's he's always been special to me. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, well, yeah. That's that is really special to have that and and to have, you know, those memories. And you know, sorry to hear that he passed in the recent, you know, recently. But that's 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 special, you know, to have that, to have someone so so close to you and also have a similar thing to do, right? You know, there's a lot of people out there who don't get to go into business or go, don't get to go and do the same things that their family members did. And, you know, you and, and, and a select few people get that experience and you get to learn and be around them. But the special part is you also get to see them around their friends and you get to see how much respect their friends have for your uncle. Exactly. And that's that's the special part, right, is you get to see them be themselves and not look up to them as a parent, but you look up to, or, or, or as a family member, you get to look up to that person as you know, we're in the Marine Corps together, and this guy has so much respect from his other fellow. That's special. That's really special. Yeah, you know, I, what I think about it is that, uh, you know, I was raised by people that were born in, in the 1870s, mm -hmm. you know. They were, you know, they were, uh, you know, my mother was born in 1911, uh, and she uh, she grew up with all of those old Indians, and, you know, and then my grandfather and uh, my Aunt Laura, all those old, I remember all those old women, yeah. you know. There were very few old men, but all, all these old women uh, were all together and they were always sitting around telling stories and smoking cigarettes, you know. 
and uh, some of them old ladies had tattoos, you know, they had tattoos on their on their face or on their hand, and uh, and for, and they would just tell a lot of old stories. So I got to hear a lot of a lot of old stories about people, you know, and and some of the things that they uh, legends and so that always kind of uh, inspired me, you know. And I said, well, I'm going to know about that, you know. I, so I make a point to, to I wished I'd asked more questions to those people, you know. I, I, I missed a, an opportunity. But uh, in the latter years of my mother, uh, Jean and I would go over there and, and we would ask her and we tape recorded her uh -huh. stories and she would tell us some, some old stories, you know, and, and uh, how she would interpret for people, you know, and some of the things. That, then I remember uh, my grandfather talking about uh, some old medicine men <clears throat> and what they did and, and uh, how they, some of the things that they did in healing people and doing some strange, unusual things. Uh, so those things, <clears throat> I, I was I was fortunate to to listen to those stories, but I regret that I didn't ask more questions. I just regret it, you know. Yeah. And until it was too late, it was too late. You know, I lost my grandfather in uh, about '68, and, uh, and then my, my aunt Laura died when I was. When I, and then all those old women also all started mm -hmm. passing away. But they, you know, and they all spoke Cheyenne. My mothers could speak Cheyenne, Arapaho, Sioux, English, and Mexican. She had a fifth grade education. They wouldn't, my, her parents wouldn't put her, wouldn't put her, because they didn't want her going to the boarding school and being taken away. So they just kept her. Yeah. And, and they, uh, rather than when they were down here, when they, they was taking all these children, they went to, they went to South Dakota. And stayed up there for a couple of years, you know, and then came back. Yeah. So they wouldn't they wouldn't put her their children in those boarding schools. So Wow. Yeah, I I I um to the point of recording conversations, I I interviewed my granddad two years ago. Just because just to have it, you know, because yeah. it's it you know, just and also for you know, and, and thankfully he he's still still here and, and they're back in Wales, but you know, just to whenever time comes and it's you know it's his time and, and we get to remember him through his voice and, and like it's that special hearing someone's voice after they've passed I think it's something that's you know to have that and to do it with all family members because they those stories they're going to get lost right and they just you know we keep them going right by telling those stories but if you have them documented and, and through their own words yeah my mother has uh, told a whole bunch of stories and it, they're all at uh, Oklahoma History Center uh -huh. so you can get those you can get those and and uh, Smithsonian would come to the house and they would interview all those old ladies and, and my grandpa and so you can I can go I can go to the Smithsonian and click on it and and hear him talking wow. and hear him singing my grandfather had a great voice he could really sing and uh, he was I was told that uh, a lot of the songs that would have been lost if he if he hadn't mm -hmm. taught them yeah. to the people. He said those old some of them old songs are two and three hundred years old, you know, mm -hmm. if not if not older, and and he he had all of those songs, yeah. what they call a startup song, and and uh, <clears throat> Grandpa knew all those songs and those old singers, they, he taught them all those songs and they passed it on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's it's a yeah that I, it was a if I, I had a. Interesting childhood growing up, you know, and mm -hmm. with, uh, I remember my sisters told us one time, she told uh, told Aunt Laura, they, they told Aunt Laura, I said, how come you treat them boys better than us? You treat them boys better than, than you treat us. And Aunt Laura, bird woman said, they're going to have to die for you someday. I said, those men are going to, those boys are going to have to die for you one day, protecting you, protecting the village. And, you know, she said, and they're going to have, they're going to give their lives up for you. She said, that's why we treat those boys like that, because we know that they're going to, they're going to die. That's how all them old women had no husbands, because they they were all killed in the 1870s, 1880s, you know? Yeah. And uh, some of them never married again, you know? And so that, that, that was, and then they would, then they would tell us, uh, keep your shoes right by the bed. Keep your shoes by the bed. You might have to get up and run. And I thought, why well, would I have to get up and run? Then as I got older, I realized that uh, you would have to get up and run because that's what they did when they were attacked in the early mornings or they would have to get up and run. At, at uh, Cheyenne, uh, Washita, mm. that's what they did. They had to jump and run in the snow barefoot. And uh, 
I did a, I did a painting, and it's going to be on display at this art show here that uh, of two young teenage girls running through the snow with a, with a um, army guy riding up on them on a horse with his carbine, and he's looking at them, and you know they just slaughtered those those women and children, and and some of the older men, they just slaughtered them all, and uh, they just he just looked at them, and. He turned his horse away and rode away. He didn't harm him. They were 14-year-old girls, 14-year-old girls. Moving behind and, and Cornstalk were their names, if I remember correctly. Uh, and I heard that story about that. And 10 years after that fight, they had a reunion of that. And that soldier came back and he, he met them two girls again after 10 years, you know, after they'd already killed killed a bunch of them. And this guy had compassion on them, two little girls, and let them go. Yeah. And, I, and I, so I, I painted that, and I called it uh, Crimson Dawn. Uh -huh. You can see smoke in the background and fire in the background. These two little girls are running away, and this guy riding up. It's it's upstairs, and it'll be in it on exhibit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that exhibit, it, it's going to be, because um, there's four or five of you artists, yeah. I believe, right, that, that's kind of cur curating it and coming together to tell the story. And that's the beauty, I think, of, of you know what you're doing now is, you know, after retiring, right, you, you don't have to paint people no more. I mean, you still do, but you get to do, you get to tell these these incredible stories and the history through your painting, which is which is really cool to do and really great. It's kind of like your service, I guess, back to, you know, back to whoever that wants to learn about this is recreating that scene through your artwork. And obviously, you know, you you gone on and worked for 50 years and did fantastic work, you know, for OSBI and, and the law enforcement. But, you know, I, I love the side of you that's doing this work that, you know, with the, with the passion that you have, because obviously, you know, putting criminals away is, is a great thing to do. But just from hearing you talk, your passion is doing, telling Native American history, telling yeah. your history, you know, obviously you were very good at your job and did amazing things. And that's why you have great recognition. But the art side, the art, probably the artist in you is like, I want to paint my history, my heritage, and tell my story. Well, that's true. That's how. Right? <laughs> like, I get up, came downstairs this morning, and, you know, and I started painting, started, started trying, to, trying to finish a painting. Mm -hmm. And that's how come I got paint on my hand. I didn't even think. <laughs> I love it. <clears throat> so, I'm glad yeah. you showed up with paint on your hand, because that's a sign <laughs> of a, you know, it just, everyone I know who's an artist always has paint on them. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So uh, Mike Larson just was, I'd go over see him, he'd just be covered in paint. Just paint all over his hands and on his clothes and his apron is just, just had a splash of yeah. color on it everywhere, you know, because yeah. he, and I'd say, what are you doing? He said, I'm painting, Harvey, I'm painting. He said, that's what I do every day, I paint. I said, all right. Master of your craft, right? I mean, if you love what you do, you've got to do it every day and it doesn't feel like work, but you also, you know, that's why if you're a painter, if you're a musician, if you like to play golf like me, you know, the more you play, the better you're going to get at it. Yeah. Right? The more you do it. So. Oh, I was lost this past year. Uh, I fell off the tractor. I slipped off the tractor and I jammed my hand into that steel deck and I, and I uh, tore the tendons in this, these three fingers when I hit. Yeah. And uh, so I couldn't hold a paintbrush for eight months. I couldn't. I couldn't. I couldn't even write my name. And that was terrible. Yeah. It was terrible that that I that I I couldn't even because I tried to in my hand. I couldn't hold it. Uh -huh. And uh, but it uh, it finally healed up. I could close my hand. Yeah. And uh, I started painting again. You know, and I was I had such satisfaction. I felt so. I felt lost for eight months. Because I couldn't do that. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's a. Gina, it's how, how was he for those eight months? <laughs> <laughs> He's a little lost. A little, a little lost. It's hard, hard work for yeah. eight months. Yeah. yeah. It's not, yeah, because like you've lost your part of you, right? Like that's, that's what you do every day. If someone, you, you know, you can't paint anymore, it's like, I mean, yeah, it was what am I going to do all day? Frustrating. It was really frustrating. I yeah. Just, I guess it was a good thing it came during the. During the pandemic, mm -hmm. when we went also, you know, so, yeah. and uh, we kind of had a, a lull, but uh, I had, to, I went to the doctor because I was so concerned. I, I thought, I thought I broke something. And uh, he said, he took a tuning fork and he tapped it, got it, got it vibrated and he put it on my hand. He said, does that hurt? I said, no. He said, well, you didn't break anything then. He said, because if, the, he said, if, if you had uh, fractured one of those bones, he said, that hurt like hell. Yeah. 
that vibration and put it went into that. I said, well, damn, why'd you do that? <laughs> he said, well, it's a lot easier than sending you in there and having an, an x-ray an ticket. X-ray. He said, we got it done. He said, so. Yeah. Yeah, that, that would have hurt so much. All those little bones in your fingers if you'd have broken something. That yeah. that would have been awful. Yeah, it was all black and blue. My hands, my fingers were all bruised up. And, uh, but, uh, you know, I've, I've had a... I've had a, a great career. I've got good kids. My kids are all, you know, uh, you worry about your children. And, uh, but uh, for the most part, you know, my, my kids are all professionals doing something, you know, and, mm-hmm. and uh, I don't worry about them. Yeah. You know, I'm not stressed out about them. And I think that's a blessing. And you know, when you have to worry about your children, I know so many guys that, that worry about their kids because they're on the wrong way, mm-hmm. going the wrong way. Yeah. So, yeah. Coming up to modern day, present, present day, you have a book, right? Tell me, tell me about the book and, and what you're doing recently, you know, t- spreading some, <clears throat> some love about the book. I know you signed some this morning. What's, uh, what's the book about? The book is, uh, it's called the children of white thunder. Okay. And, um, uh, it starts in 1830 up to the present time. Mm-hmm. And, uh, it talks about, <clears throat> uh, White Thunder is an arrow keeper. He's a priest, and what what he did, and and uh, and that moves into he, he, uh, his his daughter Al Woman, who's a mountain in Colorado is named after her now. It used to be Squaw Mountain, and they took the squaw out and 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 call it Al Woman. That's my great grandma. Wow. And uh, so and she married uh, William Bent. William Bent is an Englishman. Him and his brother opened up the Santa Fe Trail, going to Santa Fe, and uh, they they built a big fort in southeast uh, Colorado. Mm-hmm. And Charles Bent went on into Colorado and became the first territorial governor of New Mexico. Okay. And and he got killed there. And uh, then uh, my great grandfather uh, Edmund Garrier was a scout and an interpreter. And uh, he was, uh, he went to school at uh, St. Mary's in Kansas and uh, his, cause his, his dad sent him there, even though he's, he's half Cheyenne and half French. And uh, <clears throat> he had uh, become educated, he went to college and, and he came back, he left there and came back and, and, and lived with the family, the, moved back into the Cheyennes and lived with the Cheyennes in a little town out here, uh, Gary, Oklahoma is named after him. Yeah. And uh, he, had a, he had a trading post there in Gary, and, and uh, he married uh, Edmund. Uh, his son was my grandfather, my mother's father. Mm. And uh, so he's the one that, that taught us a whole bunch of things, taught us a lot of stuff. It's, he always used to say, one day you'll know. You know, we said, well, tell me, tell me how that happened. Well, just pay attention. One day you'll know. And he said, he said, it's important. He said, uh, for you to discover it yourself instead of have someone tell you. So you discover it. He said, it'll be yours. It'll be yours. And if, if someone tells you, he said, you may just forget it. He said, but if you learn, if you learn it, he said, so I said, how did you know that turtle was there in that water? In the, in the, you know, the sand turtle. How did you know that turtle? He said, well, one day you'll know. So he'd tell us those kind of things, you know, show us, and he'd, he'd make bows for us. And so he's, he, uh, he married a Sioux woman, a lady by the name of Nellie Adams, and she was a, she, she rode in uh, Buffalo Bill's uh, Western show as a trick rider on horseback. She did, you know, she'd run and jump off of horses and flip around, do all, you know, she's a trick rider. My grandpa saw her and uh, he said, I'm gonna, he said, I'm gonna marry her. And so they went back up there and he, fa- he found her and he married her and they yeah. brought her back down here. So uh, then, then my mother was, my mother was uh, Anna Garrier <clears throat> and she was, uh, uh, her grandma, Julia, was uh, one of the big girls. Julia, <clears throat> and uh, so they, she spoke nothing but Cheyenne uh, language for till she was ten or twelve years old. Her Julia uh, was at Sand Creek, and my grandpa Edmund was at Sand Creek. They survived that battle in Sand Creek 
in Colorado where they slaughtered all those Indians up there. But they were survivors. <clears throat> and uh, Julia never spoke English. She was so mad, she would never speak English. She always spoke Indian. So my mother grew up that way, and she learned all these different languages, you know. And I, I experienced that one time I was, when I was a little boy. I watched uh, one of my uncles uh, and, an, and a Cheyenne man and a Comanche man. And rather than talking Comanche or Cheyenne or English, they talked to each other in Mexican. They spoke Mexican. And I thought, what, do, what, what are they doing? Why are they doing that, you know? So later on, I realized that uh, uh, people, tribal people spoke their own tribal language. And then when they met other tribes, they spoke in sign language, you know? They spoke in sign language. And, and so that's how they, the Plains people communed with other tribes, either through sign language. And then when they had allies, then they learned how to speak Arapaho, and they learned how to speak Sioux. And, and then the, the, the second, the, the fourth language they learned was Mexican because there was the influence of the Mexicans coming up. And so they, they, all, they all learned how to, how to speak Mexican because that's how they communicated with those cowboys and Damn. Mexican people. And half the Mexican people were, were, uh, uh, were in this part of the country, that, and the Indians took them as captives. Mm -hmm. you know? So you have, you have a lot of, a lot of uh, Mexican influence in the tribes, yeah. in the tribes that are not, people say that they're, they're full blood or something, probably not, you know, because they took so many captives during the wars. <clears throat> they were losing so many men that they had to replenish. So they, they took captives, took little white captives, Mexican captives from other tribes and incorporated them into, into their tribe. And so they, then they married into the tribe. And so they, you know, you have a lot of, you have a lot of uh, tribes in this, in this state that have Mexican names. Yeah. So that's, you know, that's, uh, it's interesting, you know, so, and when I said that, my mother learned all those languages, you know, because that's what they did. And those two guys spoke in Mexican to one another rather than English. They were older men, you know, they were, if they're alive today, they'd be over a hundred years old. Yeah. So it's just, you know, to observe those kind of things and, and see what, uh, how it progressed. And, and I'm fortunate enough to, to have seen those things and fortunate enough to, to experience a, a lot of ceremonies, you know, I've, I've been with a lot of different tribes and a lot of different ceremonies. And that's how I came up with the uh, idea of the, the National Memorial, mm -hmm. you know, was that uh, rather than making a statue, I wanted, I wanted a place where people could come and do a ceremony, you know, and, and be part of a ceremony. So I incorporated the water and the, the air and the fire and the earth, and I incorporated the directions and I incorporated the cardinal points and the sacred colors, you know, and then I put eagle feathers on it, you know, and I put lance and I, all things that people could could uh, relate to. And and I, I did. We call it the Red Road. But uh, some uh, some northern uh, California tribes said we don't have a Red Road. I said, well, we'll call it the path of life. I said, it's how you how you live. Yeah when you walk, it's how you live, and you try to stay on the path, and you might vary off, you know, and, and drift away, you know, and then, and, but you get pulled back. Mm -hmm. So you try to stay on that path of harmony, you know, and so that's, and I said, I want to put a path of harmony, and, and then the, the harmony leads you into that circle, and once you get inside that circle, then you're in harmony with all these things, with the sacred colors. And I put prayer cloths in there. And people can tie prayer cloths. We got a prayer cloth tree. We uh, we tie prayer. If someone says, "Hey, pray for me," we'll I go out. And we'll take a ribbon and pray on it and tie it in the tree. And every time the wind blows, that, that prayer goes out. So we, our tree is just full of it, full yeah. of those. And uh, we did that at Bear Butte too, uh, with Sacred Mountain to the Cheyennes and the Sioux. And so, you know, those kind of things that you you live in a ceremony, and that's what I incorporated in, and. Uh, that's how come all of those, all those different tribes for two years, you know, when they, they put out some guidelines and I didn't even read the guidelines. I just put all that stuff in there. And then once, once I realized that I was one of the finalists, then I, I looked at and I saw all these incorporations of, of what it was, what it was supposed to do. And, uh, it was supposed to be a, a place and they wanted me to put a, an entry and an exit to it. I wouldn't do it. I said, I'm not having people, uh, 
take a shortcut through our through our dedication and our memorial, going someplace else. I said, we will, I want one entryway and one, and it's, it's just in, in and out. You have to want to go there. I said, and it, it's not, not where you're going somewhere else, it's destination. I want it to be a destination. And that's what we, that's what we did, you know, and they said, okay, okay. I said, no, they were, they were pretty good about uh, uh, keeping, keeping the idea, our concept. Gene and I's concept. We we kept that concept, and we we kind of shifted some things around and, and made things a little better. And you know, we uh, some things that I wasn't I wasn't even uh, didn't even think about. Example: uh, They want to know what kind of fire I wanted. I said, a hot fire, man. <laughs> fire. But, but they said, yeah. no, what color? Yeah. What color do you want it to be? You want it to be blue, white, red, mixed, oranges? I said, yeah, make it look like a campfire. And and then. I said I want it to be eternal. They said no, you can't have you can't have an eternal fire there because you're in the wood, you're in the trees there. You're right across from, and they have some eternal fi water fires there, but they're in in big pools of water, great big pools of water, and uh, so uh, we had. Uh, it was it was just we kept true to the concept, but we changed some things and moved some things around and. Yeah. And so it was, it's been a it's been a good ride. Yeah, been a good ride for us. We've we've really enjoyed it. Gene and I've really had it. Yeah, had it no good. doubt. I mean, the, the last few years for you, obviously, you know, you you have the uh, Warrior Circle of Honor, right? Is what it's yes. called. Yeah, titled that. And and for people listening, I'll put a link to it so you can go and check it out. You obviously that was unveiled in 2020, and then last year you get the call that you're going to be inducted into the Oklahoma Hall of Fame. Just to add on, yeah. you know, like well, how was that experience? You know, it's a uh, I'm, I'm just, I'm, sometimes I just, I'm amazed at, you know, I, uh, they inducted me into the Oklahoma, Oklahoma State Bureau of Investigations Hall of Fame, uh -huh. and then they inducted me into the Oklahoma Law Enforcement Hall of Fame, and then into the Oklahoma Military Hall of Fame, and over over 10 years, I, you know, those things just happened, yeah. and then and then the Oklahoma Hall of Fame, and then I was in, I was uh, uh, an Oklahoma Ambassador of Creativity. I, uh, I've been chairman of various national organizations, and I'm the chairman of the Indian Arts and Craft Board for the Department of Interior now, currently. And uh, uh, then they moved me. They moved us to. Uh, they made. The, yeah. They put, put a put part of the 250th anniversary of the of the United States. So we sit on that committee, and then we sit on the committee for. Uh, um, the Cold War Memorial. So Gina yeah. just Gina just talk, quit talking about yourself. <laughs> you got so much stuff going on. Hey, people listening to talk, listening to you talk. They ain't listening to me. They get to listen to me all the time. Don't worry about me. Uh, but it's fascinating that you, you know, like I said, all of the, all of these things happen. You know, and and obviously it's a product of you being very good at what you do and the service that you give and back to the you know to people, whether it's law enforcement, whether it's through art and creativity. Uh, you know, it, it's fascinating stuff. But one of the you know one of the the cool things is. is you know, I was at that ceremony last year, you know, and seeing so many people in the room and, you know, you're going up there and you're, you know, you receive your medallion and you're around these incredible group of people, you know, Justice Cargo was one of those people. And I'm really, I'm going to interview her, I think in a couple of weeks and, you know, you, you have all these people around and you just, it must be really cool to be in on stage and, and just honored by not only the entire state, but just everyone in a room and have that ceremony go on and have family there and have those get to yeah. experience it as well. Yeah, I was, I, you know, I was, I was glad for my kids, you know, mm -hmm. I was, my, I was glad for my kids and my, one of my boys told me, he said, Damn, Dad. He said you're a hard act to follow. <laughs> he said you're a hard act. He said you realize you're a hard act to follow. Yeah. I said, well, just try, just try, just mm -hmm. try to be as good as you can. Do what you can. And he's, they're all gifted. They're, they're all of my children are pretty gifted with about things. You know, some artists and so. Yeah. Well, you're just setting an example, right? You're just setting an example like your uncle did for you and like many other figures in your life have done. It's setting that example that, you know, we should work to, you know, be the best that we can be and help others. Yeah. It's follow your really own, impactful. follow your own, your own choice, your own, your own goals. I said, you don't have to. Yeah. I mean, I had two of my boys, I got into law enforcement, then they realized it's not for them, Dad, <laughs> not for me. You know, they, they said, it's just not for me. I, yeah. You know, yeah. so it's. 
but at least they know that, right? At least they figured that out. That's that's one of the things I, I like to talk about is, you know, people, we go through life and we might regret not trying something and people think, well, what if it doesn't work out? Well, so what? At least you know that that wasn't for me. You're never going to think about, oh, I should have tried this or I should have tried that. Give it a try. And if you figure if you like it, great. If you don't, try something else. Yeah, that's, uh, you know, that, you, that's exactly true. You know, you, you, uh, we're not afraid to, to step out. Yeah. You know? We're not mm-hmm. afraid to, to try it and decide decide for yourself. And, I, you know, so that, I, we all do that. You know, I, mm-hmm. I, I've, I've had so many failures in my life, you know, I've, but I'd always tell the boys, I said, uh, success is built on failure. I said, you know, you learn from those things, and, and yeah. if you, you can't quit, you learn, you to, just don't quit, just keep going, keep going. Yeah. Finishing up then, what are you excited about this fall? What do you have coming up that you're, you're kind of, you know, really in, in enjoying, and, and what are you painting at the moment? I'm painting my wife. Oh, really? Nice. Is that a personal project, or is it just someone that, is this going to go into a, uh, a museum or a gallery somewhere, or just I'd, something to? Uh, I'm probably going to hang it on the wall at the house. Yeah, keep it at the then, house, and then have it digitized and, and put a copy mm-hmm. in a in a gallery. Or yeah, something. sell prints. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, Gina, my mother gave Gina her name. Uh, she said, uh, called her Hodoke hit means uh, star woman. Okay. He said she came from the stars for you, Harvey. And my mother did not like a lot of. My brother's wife, <laughs> but she loved so Gina. You, you passed. You she passed. Did. The she test. passed. She loved Gina, and so the star woman. And uh, she said she came from the stars for you. Yeah. And so I, I, I'm doing a painting of her. Uh, awesome. Yeah. That's that's what the paint is. That's what this paint is right here. When I got. I, yeah, yeah, yeah. And when the dedication coming up? Hmm? Dedication's coming. Yeah, the dedication is coming up in November. Okay. In Washington. Yeah. And they're expecting between thirty and forty thousand Indians wow. to show up. Wow. Veterans and veterans families, and uh, different tribes are sending whole delegations of people. Mm-hmm. Cheyennes are Cheyenne Arapahoes are sending about two hundred people. Tribes are going to pay for them, send them up there yeah. for uh, about five days. That's send amazing. Them up there. And uh, a lot of tribes are sending people, you know, and yeah. so it's uh, veterans, you know, almost every tribe has a, a memorial for their veterans. Mm-hmm. Yeah. They just a memorial for their veterans, something. So it's just, that's huge. Yeah. Yeah. They, they, you know, they, they like their veterans. They like their warriors, mm-hmm. men and women. We have a lot of women, lots, lots of women yeah. that are veterans. That's, you know, uh, Indian people, uh, percentage wise, Thirty uh, some percent of of the of tribes have veterans. Thirty percent, and compared to less than Indians, have more per cap than than any other anybody else. Before whites, blacks, Mexicans, Asians, Indians put more people on the battlefield. Yeah, and that, that uh, I heard a story while I was in Washington that. Uh, a, uh, a, guy, a guy told his son, he said, uh, well, if you're going to go in the military, he said, when you get in there, he said, if you, he said, you attach yourself to an Indian, he'll bring you home. See, Shine Rappels did not have any fatalities in Vietnam, and they had a, no fatalities. And they say that's because of the medicine and the prayers that they had to protect those men. They had, not, they had some guys wounded, but nobody died there. And they put a lot of they put a lot of Indians in in Vietnam, in battle. Yeah. And no fatalities among the Southern Cheyenne and Southern Rebels. That's an amazing stat. It is for a fact. Because no, people went to Vietnam and they didn't come home. Yeah. Right. Fifty six thousand of them yeah. didn't come home. Wow. And. Uh, no fatalities among the Shiner Apples, Southern Shiner Apples. It's pretty phenomenal because in my little platoon, we had a lot of guys wounded and and uh, some guys, you know, some guys killed. I thought I thought there were a lot more killed, but we went to the wall and we looked up all their names and I said, "Well, he made he made it. 
Man, that guy got shot five times. I said, and he made it. <laughs> yeah. So. There's something about it, right? Yeah, you, there's, there's yeah. the heritage, the history, that that warrior mentality, the way that you're brought up, totally different to others, and you're not just getting in the military because it's a job, and you're not being sent somewhere because you like you are you're a warrior. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah, and that's and that's the way you 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 know. When I think about, when I think about that, I think about what my aunt Laura said. They're going to die for you someday. Yeah. You know, you're going. They're going to die for you someday. That's why we treat them that way. We don't spank them. We don't hit them. You know, mm -hmm. and, and you never saw that from those old people. You see it now. You know, because there's among the other people that are, you know, mistreat their children or leave them. You know, but but in those days, that you didn't do that thing. I never got a whipping. I never got a whipping growing up. Probably should have, but I didn't. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Gina's laughing over here thinking as multiple times you should have. I would love to just hit you across the head sometimes. We'll see. Uh, yeah. Never got one growing up, but I'm sure you might have had plenty since. <laughs> ah, brilliant. Well, thank you so much for coming yeah, down. Yeah, well, thanks Obviously. for that, You made it very easy. Made yeah. It very, I was just very you're, you're extremely busy, and I appreciate um, Gina for fitting you in our schedule and, and you know, figuring this out. Uh, you know, it's been a been an absolute blast to chat to you uh, to get, share your story I know there's a lot more and hopefully we'll get to share some more stories one day um, but I wish you safe travels for the dedication and all the other stuff that you guys are doing and for people listening go to the website if you're interested in uh, hearing more about Harvey or buying more or some, buying some of his work it's harveypratt.com and I'll put the link in the description and we will catch you next episode cheers alright thank you Hope you guys enjoyed that great episode. Thank you so much for listening. As always, huge shout out to our sponsors, the Oklahoma Hall of Fame, sharing an Oklahoma story through its people since 1927. For more information on the Oklahoma Hall of Fame, go to www.oklahomahof.com and follow them on Instagram for daily updates at Oklahoma HOF. Our other sponsor, the Chickasaw Nation, amazing sponsor they do amazing things for the state and they're always sponsoring something in oklahoma they're a huge supporter of oklahoma and without their support we wouldn't be able to do what we do and finally our third sponsor for today the oklahoma 988 mental health lifeline 988 is the direct three-digit lifeline that connects you with the trained behavioral health professionals that can get all oklahomans the help that they need learn more by visiting 988oklahoma.com it's 988oklahoma.com. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. We are inspired by those around us and hope that you are too. Make sure you subscribe to this podcast on your favorite podcast platform and leave us a review so we can keep telling your stories. For more great Oklahoma content, follow This Is Oklahoma on Facebook and Instagram.